Imagine with me, you're minding your own business, mending your fishing nets on the dock one day like you do a whole lot of days of your life. This dock extends out into this large lake where you make your living. You can't catch fish in a net that has tears in it, so you take the time to uh, keep the nets mended. And then this stranger walks up to you, somebody you've never seen before, and he says something unusual. He says, hey, put down your nets, and if you come follow me, I'll show you how to catch men. I've never heard anything like that before, you think, and something compels you. You don't know what it is, but something compels you to go along with him. So you leave your fish and nets behind and you start following him and you're not, you don't realize it, but you're going to be following him for the rest of your life. It doesn't take long before the things that he does and the things that he says and how he says them and the things that you watch him do th- every day make you realize pretty soon, I've never met anybody like this man. He's different from anybody I have ever met in my life. And rumors are spreading around the countryside as you're following him around. This could be the one. This could be the long-awaited Messiah, the anointed one from God. Your own brother, Andrew, I have a brother, Andrew. Your own brother, whose name is Andrew as well, your own brother, Andrew, thinks so. He's the Messiah, Andrew tells you. And then another friend, a friend by the name of Nathaniel, says, you know what? I figured it out. He's the Son of God. He is the King of Israel. He's not just who you think he is. I think you think uh, he's a carpenter. He's from Nazareth. He's not a prince from Jerusalem, how can he be the king of Israel? In the neighboring town of Cana, there up in the area around the Sea of Galilee, some of Jesus' friends um, are getting married. There's a wedding, and his mom is among the honored guests. And he and Jesus and his disciples, and now he's got several of these guys, they're invited to come along. And during the party, when they had have weddings in the, in the Middle East, especially back in those days, I'm not sure about now, but their wedding festivities would last a whole week. You know, it was one great big party. And you can imagine a week uh, with a whole wedding crowd full of frat boys. That would be interesting. But the wedding lasts a long time, several days, and the host becomes embarrassed probably the father of the groom, becomes embarrassed because he didn't realize people would be drinking so much and now all of the wine is consumed. There's nothing left. And you know what he's thinking. He's probably thinking, who invited those fishermen anyway, you know? (laughs) Sensing her friend's embarrassment, Jesus' mother, Mary, approaches him, approaches her son and whispers in his ear and says, they, they don't have any wine. They're out of wine. And, and it seems she expects him to do something about it. But you have no clue. What, what's he going to do? I mean, is he going to send all of us, his disciples, his followers, and say, hey, guys, run down to 7-Eleven real quick and Boone's Farm. Doesn't matter what it is. Just grab it and bring it back. They still make that? I, 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 they used to, didn't they, Jamie? It was cheap. <laughs> we're, we're not going there. No, we won't go there anymore. Well, after a brief conversation with Mary that you really don't understand, she tells the caterer, listen, here's my son, and you do whatever he tells you. Now, you know, you, you and I all know some moms are like that. They think their sons hung the stars in heaven. Well, Mary was right. He did. <laughs> She's apparently one of those moms that think there's nothing my son can't do. And so over there, on, over in the corner up against the wall, there are six large stone water pots, large, holding 20 to 30 gallons of water apiece. The water was going to be used for 
It's used for religious ceremonial washings at the, as they get ready to worship and as they get ready to sacrifice and so forth. And Jesus says to the servants, he says, look, go fill those pots up with water. And you think, well, that's nice, but the guests are all going to leave because they don't want water. They want wine. And so they filled all the six pots to the brim with water. And then Jesus says, now, Go over and get a scoop, cup, and scoop some out and take it to the head waiter. And so someone does that, and the head waiter takes this water that had been drawn from the pot, and sometime between it being scooped out of the pot until he tasted it, a transformation took place in what was in that cup. And he tasted it, and he when he said, he, he did, he said, this is the best wine we've had yet. Somehow the water in the pots have become really good wine. And you're asking yourself, how did that happen? That's impossible. And it got your attention for sure. Our, our sermon series today, we're going to, starts today, is going to begin for three months, taking us back to look at some of the miracles that Jesus performed during his brief three-and-a-half-year ministry. I went on Bible.org, and and it lists there for us 35 different miracles that are in the Gospels. Now, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke and John and Mark all pretty much tell the same side of the story of Jesus, mostly of him when he was up in Galilee, and they tell a lot of the same stories, a lot of the same miracles are repeated in those three synoptic Gospels. John talks more about what Jesus did down in Judea. So John's got some different miracles that the others didn't record, but about 35 in the Gospels, different miracles that Jesus performed prior to his crucifixion. So these miracles would not include the greatest miracle, and that was his own resurrection. But everything that he did, not everything, but a lot, 35 of the things. For example, at least 18 miracles were of healing healing of all kinds of physical diseases and handicaps and injuries. At least nine involved overpowering nature. Or making the impossible happen, turning water into wine, was one of those. Feeding the 5,000 would have been another. Stilling the storm, walking on the water, cursing the fig tree, all overcoming nature and doing impossible things. At least five involved overpowering demonic powers, casting out demons and freeing people from demon oppression and possession. And then at least three times that we know of, he raised someone from the dead, other than himself, at least three times. And you say, all of these, you say at least 18, at least nine, at least five, at least three, but you said there were 35. We don't know how many miracles Jesus did, do do we? In fact, they weren't, the ones that are recorded are not likely all that he did. Three times in Matthew, we're told that, listen, it says that many sick people were brought to him, and it says in Matthew's gospel, and he healed them all. So if 100 people were brought to him sick and he healed 100 people, how many miracles is that? I count that as 100, don't you? John writes at the end of his gospel, I'm at the very last chapter in John 21. I'm going to read the last two verses. I think you'll have the last verse, verse 25, up on the screen for you. But John says, as he ends this gospel, this biography of Jesus, John finishes it with this. Instead of his signature, he says, this is the disciple who testifies to these things. I saw myself all of these things happen. And I wrote them down. And we know that his, this disciple's, testimony is true. I'm an eyewitness. Then verse 25. And he says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written by, one by one, I suppose not even the world itself c- could contain the books that could be written. So are these all of the miracles of Jesus? Probably not, but they're enough of a selection that the Holy Spirit decided to include in the Word of God for us to know about Jesus and his power today. Nothing is recorded of Jesus doing any miracles, by the way, until after his baptism by John the Baptist. Uh, There are some made-up tales, and perhaps you've heard some of these, 
made up tales uh, of Jesus as a child doing supernatural things. Have you heard of some of those things? You know, I've, I've read, I can't even remember some of the stories, but one of them involved birds, I think. And there's all kinds of stories that when Jesus was a kid, he did this. There's no source for those things other than legend. They're not in the scriptures. But then Luke chapter 4, verse 14, 14 we read that after his baptism, or at his baptism, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and then we read from that point on of his works of power, his miracle working. Sometimes we, if I asked you today, have you ever seen God do a miracle? And a lot of you would raise your hands. And I think, and, and please listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. I'm not discounting mir miracles happening today. I believe they do. But I think a lot of times when we see God answer a prayer, that maybe we thought there is no possibility that this could ever happen, and God answers that prayer, we call that a miracle, don't we? Have you done that? I've done that as well. Oh, that was a miracle. You know, someone was very ill, and we prayed, and they had surgery, or they had chemo, and the sickness is gone, and it's a miracle. And, and while God does answer prayers, and I believe he still does the miraculous, I think often we shortchange the true meaning of miracle, and when we shortchange the meaning of miracle, I think when re real miracles happen, they have less of an impact. Heart transplant is not a miracle. Heart transplant is a medical marvel, is it not? God certainly can be working through people that receive heart transplants. I believe that. But by definition, a miracle is this. A miracle is a supernatural act meaning something that God does. Supernatural, not human. God does it. That overrides or overpowers natural laws. Now, what's a natural law? Well, here's a natural law that everybody understands. We all understand gravity, right? Everybody got that? Gravity, apple falls off the tree and hits Isaac Newton on the head. Gravity, oh, there's gravity. That's a na gravity is a natural law. But if all of a sudden... Somebody in this room began to levitate, you know, for some spiritual reason, and you began to float up from your chair, and you went up to the ceiling of this room. That would be an overpowering of a natural law, would it not? And we would look at that and go, that's a miracle. Did God do it? Well, sometimes I believe the scripture shows us that the devil has powers to do supernatural things as well. So we don't need to be necessarily looking for miracles today to confirm our faith, do we? And I think a lot of people are deceived by things that they see or things that they think that, they're, that they see. Sometimes, again, the body heals itself, does it not? I mean, we have this incredible body that God has created that has these incredible powers within it to fix things that are broken. I, I was, somebody was telling me the other day about somebody they knew who needed bypass surgery and their heart grew new arteries or veins or whatever it is connecting to, the, to bypass itself the ones that were blocked. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. Is that a miracle? Well, no, that's God's creative power in the body. I would not call that a miracle because it happens lots and lots and lots. Not something, it's a medical marvel, it's a biological marvel. But since God created this amazing healing characteristics within our body, we can attribute that to God, certainly. But miracle, maybe not. A miracle is when the impossible happens and there is no other explanation than God did it. The word miracle, I've been giving you a lot, it seems like in the last few weeks, especially in our last series, giving you a lot of Greek words. And I hope you're using them um, you know, as you go out and about town and you spout off some of your Greek words that you know and people are really impressed with you if you do that. Um, I go across the road to, uh, to Mulligan's restaurant sometime. The owner of the restaurant was born in Greece. He speaks Greeks, Greece and and. Uh, and Aleka, who's one of the hostesses there, she's Greek. And uh, just go and say, hey, can I speak some Greek to you? And here's a, here's a new word that you can wow them with. Say, hey, dunamis. And after they look at you like, what in the world? You're speaking Greek to me. Well, why are you doing that? 
Dunamis is the Greek word that's translated miracle in our New Testament. You might be familiar with dunamis because it's often translated in the New Testament as the word power. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is the one a lot of us are familiar with. When Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended into heaven, he said, you're going to receive dunamis. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you're going to use that power to be my witnesses all over this world. Same word for miracle in the New Testament. So a miracle was intended to emphasize a mighty work and a power, the power that was behind it. Jesus' miracles were evidence of God's power in action. If you want to know why were the miracles, they were evidence that God was at work in and through Jesus among the people in his time. A second word that often accompanies Jesus' miracles is the word wonder. Wonder. We sang that word in one of the, I think, we sang how great thou art. That word wonder is in there, isn't it? Wonder focuses on the effect that the miracle had on those who witnesses. The wonder. Wonder implies it's beyond our explanation how it happened. Wonder, for example, when Jesus spoke and he calmed that storm on the Sea of Galilee. The word wonder was used there. We sometimes think of, of his wonder as those things that we don't understand. And he's out there walking, or not walking, he's in the boat, and the sea is stormy with his disciples in the boat. And, and they wake him up and they say, don't you care, we're all about to drown. And he wakes up and he looks out on the sea and, and he says to the storm, be still. And immediately, and those of us who live here around the water, we understand the difference between a sound or an ocean that's full of white caps and when it becomes like a sheet of glass. And that's what it became. And Mark 4.41 says the, the disciples expressed their wonder by asking this question, well, who then is this? Even the wind and sea obey him. I mean, it's one thing to say to a bunch of pots of water turn into wine. It's another thing to change the weather. They thought. A paralyzed man was brought to him by <clears throat> four friends. Couldn't get into the house where Jesus was teaching. You know the story. And uh, so they t went up on the roof, which was a flat roof laid with tiles. And they went up on the roof and they said, we got to get our friend to Jesus. And so they put him on this, had him on this stretcher that they made. And with ropes, they, first they pulled up back the tiles and made a hole in the roof. And then with ropes, they lowered him right down into the room where Jesus was teaching, right in front of Jesus, and Jesus healed him. And the Bible says in Mark 2, 12, and immediately he got up, picked up his stretcher, and went out in front of everyone. And as a result, they were all astounded and gave glory to God. And what did they say? We have never seen anything like that. They were in wonder at what just happened. Well, the Jews of Jesus didn't have too much of a problem acknowledging his ability to work miracles. I mean, they saw the miracles. It's difficult to deny something that you see right before your very eyes. Couldn't be denied. And so since they couldn't say about Jesus' miracles, oh, no, 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 it, it didn't happen. They couldn't say that because not only did they see it, but lots of other people saw it as well. They began to challenge it. We can't deny that he's doing these powerful, mighty, wonderful things. So if we can't deny that he's doing them, what's our next strategy? How do we deal with this? And they said, we know. Here's what we'll do. We'll say it's not from God. It's not God's power. It's the devil's. And they questioned where he got the power to do things. And, of course, they said that his miracle working ability came from a relationship that he had with Satan. They denied him as their Messiah. <clears throat> Here's an example, Matthew 12, verses 22 to 24. A demon-possessed man who was blind and unable to speak was brought to him. And he healed him so that the man could both speak and see. And all the people were astounded and said, Perhaps this is the son of David. Let me stop there. These people, these Jewish people are saying, This guy really could be Messiah. But well, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the skeptics, the critics, when they heard this, they said, no, 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 no. This man drives 
out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler, by Satan, by the ruler of the demons. So we can say that the miracles of Jesus were both demonstrations of his unique divine power and they were wonder-working, awe-inspiring spectacles. It's a sad commentary, actually, that the crowds that followed Jesus around, so many of them did so simply because they wanted to see what he might do next. (laughs) This is a great show. Let's go to the next place and see what he does. To them, he was a source of entertainment to so many. To them, he was simply a sideshow at the circus. A third word in the Gospel of John that often accompanied Jesus' miracles was the word sign. Sign. John 2.11 says, Jesus performed his, this first sign, the first miracle he did, the turning of water into wine. He did this in Cana of Galilee. He displayed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Did this miracle, and it says, and his disciples, these men have been following him around, including Peter and James and John and Andrew, these fishermen. We left their nets behind. Now they began to believe in him. He's not just a great teacher. He's not just a compelling, charismatic personality. He's more than that. They began to believe in him. The sign points to something. It maybe gives direction or instruction. And the Bible says the word sign means there has been, in the, through these miracles, there's been instructive revelation about God. He taught something every time he did a miracle. See, Jesus was no entertainer. He wasn't interested in entertaining the troops. He wasn't a physician. He wasn't a traveling show. But these revelations that came with his miracles can teach us theology. And I, and I know we have a lot of guests here, and I bring that word up every now and then to our church, and I say, please, please, don't let that word scare you. We just finished a series where we dealt with theology. Don't let that word scare you. Theology is the doctrine of God, and Jesus' miracles were intended to teach us something about who God is. So as we begin the study of some of Jesus' miracles, let me wrap up today with the why. Why did he do them? Why was it necessary? Why couldn't Jesus just teach? His teaching was pretty powerful stuff, was it not? His teaching was stuff that, that, again, the disciples and the others heard him, and even Nicodemus says, hey, we never heard anybody teach the things that you've taught. Where did you get all this? This is amazing. Even when he was a boy, there is this one story about Jesus' boyhood. When the family came down to Jerusalem for the festival and they kind of lost him and he was stayed behind and they had to go back. Mary and Joseph had to backtrack into the city to find him and they found him sitting before these Jewish elders and he was confounding him them with what he knew, with his teaching, with his doctrine. Why? Why did Jesus do miracles? Well, because his miracles teach us. Here's some things this morning that I want you to get as we lay the foundation for this series. And you'll see these things come out in every Sunday from now through August. First of all, they teach us that God was with Jesus. He was with Jesus. Nicodemus, that Jewish leader, ruler of the Jews that came to Jesus by night, John chapter 3, made this confession to Jesus. He said, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. We know that. And here's how we know that. No one could perform these signs unless God was with him. Nobody could do this unless God's involved in it. We know this. And and, uh, it's interesting that he uses the word we. He didn't say, I know this. He said, we know this. Who would the we be? Well, he was, again, a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews. Apparently, there were some in that group that agreed with Nicodemus. But it went against popular Jewish thought. Nobody can do these things. Nobody can really be the son of God, but yet Nicodemus somehow, apart from peer pressure and what everybody else in his group was thinking, Nicodemus got it. You, you, you're, God is with you somehow. Secondly, his miracles teach us that Jesus was from God. John chapter 3, verse 2, again, Nicodemus said, you've come from God. John chapter 9, verses 32 and 33 is another scripture for you there. 
They teach us that Jesus had authority from God to forgive sins. Now, at the end of his ministry, as he's sending his disciples out into all the world, Matthew chapter 28, we call it the Great Commission, verses 19 and 20. He begins with verse 18. He says, all authority has been given unto me. Well, who would give all authority to Jesus? It must be the Father. It must be God the Father. He said that at the end of his ministry. But he said that before as well. He had authority to forgive sins in Mark chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. And Matthew 9, Luke chapter 5, they all tell the same story, but it's all about authority to forgive sins. We'll touch on that in a little bit. Jesus was approved by God. His miracles tell us God put his stamp of approval on Jesus. The ultimate stamp of approval, of course, was his resurrection when God raised him from the dead to say everything he did, everything he said was absolute truth. You need to believe it by raising him from the dead. He was approved by God. Acts 2.22, Peter's preaching to a crowd of Jews in the city of Jerusalem just some 50 days or so after Jesus has resurrected These people, a lot of them were in town, and if they weren't in town, maybe they've heard the story about this Messiah, this one who claimed to be Messiah, who'd been crucified, so he can't be Messiah, but then he disappeared from his grave. We're not sure where he went, and Peter's preaching the sermon to these people, and he says, this Jesus, the Nazarene, was a man pointed out to you by God. How did God point Jesus out to them? With miracles and wonders and signs that God did Among you, in your presence, you saw them many. I mean, how many people saw Jesus take a little boy's lunch and turn it into enough food to feed a hungry crowd and there was lots left over? There were at least 5,000 there. He did this among you through him just as you yourselves, you can't deny this, you saw. And if you didn't see it, some of your friends were there at these things and they told you about it. You're witnesses, you've heard about it. Jesus was approved by God. His miracles tell us that. And then the, the miracles tell us that Jesus is, the Father, excuse me, is in Jesus, and Jesus is in the Father. Well, one of the things he taught was, I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, he said, you've seen the Father. You can't separate us except theologically to give us understanding of the Trinity. He's in the Father, and the Father's in him. John 10, verses 37 and 38, Jesus said, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, if you don't believe what I'm saying, believe because of the works themselves. If nothing else, look at the miracles. What do they tell you? His miracles teach us that in Jesus the kingdom of God has come. We talk about the kingdom. We did a series earlier in the spring about the kingdom, that it's not yet here. But when Jesus was present, when the king is on the earth, the kingdom's come. And he let them know that. Matthew chapter 12 and Luke 11, he said, If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Saying that specifically to all these Jews, because that was the big thing the Jews were waiting for, is the kingdom of God to arrive, and for Messiah, the son of David, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, wonderful counselor, and so forth, to be present on the earth. And he said, I'm here. The kingdom of God is here with you. The miracles teach us then that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Messiah, the Christ. Matthew 11, Luke 7. When John, this is John the Baptist, he's been imprisoned. You know the story about John being put in prison by Herod. He's in prison, and when he heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he heard about the miracles that Jesus was doing, and he knows Jesus, doesn't he? They're cousins. He baptized Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. And he's hearing Jesus is going around the countryside, and he's doing miracles, man. And people began, his buddies came back. His own disciples would come to the jail cell and tell him, here's what Jesus is doing. He sent a message by his disciples to ask Jesus. And the question is, are you the one who is to come? Or should we wait, expect someone else? I find that one of the most fascinating quotes in the New Testament that John the Baptist had some doubts. John the Baptist himself, I want to be sure about this. Are you 
really the Messiah? Because it was John the Baptist, remember, when he baptized Jesus, and he, before he saw, as he saw Jesus approaching the river, he said what? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But things have been happening in John's life, and he's starting to, man, have, have I gotten this messed up? So he sends these friends of his to Jesus to ask this question, and Jesus says, Here, here's what I want you to tell John. Go back to John and tell him what you hear and what you see. Tell him this, John, the blind see. John, the lame walk. Those with skin diseases like leprosy are healed. John, the deaf are hearing. John, listen, the dead are being raised. John, this is what we're seeing and hearing about Jesus. And the poor, John, are being told the good news. They're being given the gospel. John, he really is. That was the proof that John needed to hear. And then the gospels teach us that Jesus is the Son of God. Matthew chapter 14 When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Jesus and Peter out there walking around on the sea, skiing with no skis. <laughs> they get back in the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him. The boat became a church, if you will. They worshipped him, and they said, the disciples said, truly you are the Son of God. The miracles taught them that. And then lastly, the miracles taught them that Jesus had compassion for people. Matthew 14, 14, he stopped ashore, stepped ashore off the boat. He sees this huge crowd, and it says he felt compassion for them and healed their sick. The miracles teach us the, the compassion that God has for us. Most of his miracles, when you go and you look through them, most of his miracles were done to help others who had no other way to help themselves. Some had spent lots of money on doctors. Some had waited poolside, waiting for an angel to come and stir the water so they could get in first and be healed by the waters. But they never could get in first. They waited years and years. Most were done for people who had no other way to get help, and we see Jesus coming along and how much he cared for them. And so as a result of Jesus' miracles, grieving parents, families, lepers, people with lifetime illnesses, people with demonic oppression, people with handicaps, people who had born, been born unable to walk, unable to see, Jesus reached out to them because he loved them. And as we go through these miracles, I hope this summer you'll be listening and for his kindness. And sometimes even, even risking his own health to reach out to these men and these women to change others' lives. Well, his miracles then authenticated his message. What are his miracles? Why? We're talking about why the miracles? They authenticated the things that he was saying. And that was a response we read of Nicodemus. You, you've got to be teaching truth. Your message has to be true. Otherwise, you couldn't do these things. When the paralyzed man was lowered down to his friends by, uh, by his friends, lowered down to Jesus by his friends, the first thing Jesus said to the man, he didn't say, look at him and say, pick up your bed and walk. That wasn't the first thing he said. Remember what the first thing he said? He said, son, your sins are forgiven. I'm sure everybody was a little bit perplexed. Don't you get it, Jesus? They want you to heal him. He didn't start with that. He said, hey, I'm, I'm forgiving your sins. Your sins are forgiven. And, and by the way, that was not, please don't twist that to say something. It's not Jesus wasn't saying to the man, well, the reason you're paralyzed is because such, you're such a bad sinner. That wasn't what he was saying. Don't get caught up in a poor theology that says whenever somebody is sick, it's because they did something wrong. 
But Jesus was making a strong, apologetic point to the Jews to prove to them who he was. And when he said, your sins are forgiven, it made the Jews mad. They got angry about it. That Jesus claimed, not only can I forgive sins, they accused him of blasphemy. Blasphemy means you're claiming to be God and you're not. After all, who can forgive sins but God? And they would ask him that question. Who can forgive sins but God? And he would just look at them and wink. Oh, you're getting it. Yep. So Jesus made his point. Here's what he said in Mark 2, verses 9 and 11. Okay, guys, then which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say pick up your stretcher and walk? Which one's easier, do you think? Huh? But so that you may know that the Son has authority on earth to forgive sins, he turned to the paralytic man on the stretcher and he said to him, I tell you, pick up your stretcher and go home. Of course, the story is that he did. Got up and walked and went home. And he, if he could heal the man, which was something humanly impossible, he could also forgive sins. Again, something only God could do. So let's con conclude this morning with this thought. For some of you, this is the challenge you maybe or came to Nags Head Church for. His miracles force us to make a decision about Jesus Christ. If he's done all these things, all these witnesses, it's written down. People didn't deny it. Even his enemies didn't deny he was doing these things. They force us to make a decision about him. They prove he was no near man, that he was not just a good man, that he was not just a captivating teacher, that he was not just a charismatic personality. His claims to be God were either true. Here's, here's what you got to decide. Either they were the absolute truth or he was a liar or he was a lunatic. Either he knew he was lying or else he was deluded, thinking he was someone he was not. So as we go through this summer and we read these stories in the Gospels, we have to, church, we have to absorb them either as myth and fairy tale or we better take them seriously, that this is the real thing. But it wasn't the miracles alone which brought men to faith. Please hear me. Believing in miracles doesn't equate believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God who paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. So you and I either have to accept him or reject him. That's the bottom line. And the miracles serve to make the argument stronger that indeed he is who he claimed to be. So if he is who he claimed to be, then his words about everything else, including about salvation, including John 14, 6, he's the only way to God. Those things and many others must be true as well. And my hope this summer as we go through a dozen or so of Jesus' miracles is that, as we'll see in these miracles, not only did they attract men and women to him 2,000 years ago, but they're still attracting men and women to him today. If you're already a believer in Jesus, that's probably the majority of us in the room. His miracles, well, what about us? Well, you still need to make some decisions about Jesus, I think. We do all every day of our lives, but his miracles should confirm in your heart that the faith that you place in him is the real deal. <laughs> like John the Baptist. You know what? He's real. I have the real Savior, Jesus Christ. He's not just a man. He's not just a religious guru. He's the Son of God with the power and authority to do for you and for me what no other man can do. Let's bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are the recipients of your grace. And that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ and by Jesus Christ alone. And we thank you that for much of the time, he spent a lot of time, it seems, in his ministry, not only teaching, and he did a lot of that, but he did a lot of miracles. He did a lot of acts of kindness that nobody else could do for people who had no one else to help them. He did things that were totally what God alone could do, and he did them proving he indeed was and is God. And we thank you that they confirm our faith. 
If there's someone here today, Lord, that has not yet put their faith and trust in Jesus, my prayer is that before they leave here today, they'll stop by and talk to one of our pastors up here at the front, talk to someone here today to say, hey, how can I know this Jesus? If he did all these things, I want in on it. I want to be his follower too. That's our prayer this morning. And help us, Lord, those of us who are already Christians, that this series will do like his miracles and the words about him did for John. Strengthened his faith. Got him ready, Father, for his fate that was soon to happen to him. Lord, let him know everything's okay. You've believed in Jesus. I pray these things in his name. Amen.